welcome to Liquid Margins uh, episode, Annotation Unbound, Social Reading for Any Subject. I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis. This is kind of a special episode because we're welcoming folks from basically all over Rutgers. And it might sound like that's just a focus on a single institution, but Rutgers is one of the largest um, universities in the world. And it has so, so many multiple schools and uh, you know campuses and things going on um, that uh, we, we really thought it would be exciting uh, to kind of try to get a picture of usage in social annotation across Rutgers. So we invited a number of people here today. I'm going to be handing over the reins to my colleague Jeremy Dean in just a second, and he'll introduce these good folks and, and start the conversation with them in just a second. Thanks, Nate. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm super excited. Uh, I've been working with folks at Rutgers for many years now. Uh, some of our guests today were some of the first users of Hypothesis at Rutgers, so we go way back, and I'm excited to, to have this conversation here today. Um, I just wanted to start off by getting to know a little bit about you guys as educators outside of the social annotation of it all. So I'd just like to go around and just tell us a little bit about yourself as a, as a, as a teacher, what your philosophy is, you know, briefly, and uh, we'll get started there. Uh, Sylvia, you want to start off? Um, hi, my name is Sylvia Muller. Uh, let's see, I've been teaching at Rutgers uh, since 1998. I spent a chunk of time as a non-tenure track faculty member, but during that time, non-tenure track faculty member, but during that time I was also doing work uh, as pedagogical support for faculty that were transitioning to online and hybrid forms of uh, classrooms. So, you know, it's, it's, I've seen this from both sides of the fence. Um, uh, I've, uh, I, I came from an undergraduate degree at Sarah Lawrence College, uh, which was, which is a tiny, uh, small liberal arts college. Um, every class is, uh, heavily invested in independent work with the student working directly with the faculty member and all the classes are tiny seminars. Uh, and I did my junior year abroad at Rutgers University um, to be able to take as many classes in film history as I wanted um, and was uh, confronted with the fact that what I thought was college teaching and learning uh, was not uh, obviously the dominant pattern at Rutgers. Um, I got through it then by just kind of pretending that I was in a tiny seminar, um, which I'm sure endeared me to my faculty, to the teachers and the uh, other students. Uh, but when I started teaching here, um, it really, uh, because I knew of some of the advantages of that kind of close, intimate work with material, um, I've always been trying to get back to high touch uh, kinds of activities um, because I, I really strongly believe that uh, there was a wonderful set of research studies um, Oh, I'm going to get the title slightly wrong. Christy, can you correct me? Uh, uh, the Invisible Universe? No. Um, oh, they were done at the Cambridge. Basically, it, it's that you know students don't come to us uh, as empty vessels waiting to be filled. They come with their own set of ideas, their own mental models for how the world works. And if you never directly talk to them about how they think about the material you're showing them or you know the processes that you're trying to explain uh, then you really aren't able to do much in terms of changing their mind uh, because th what the research shows is that uh, they will kind of conform to what you're asking them to do for a while but it doesn't create lasting impressions and um, you know one of the things that I'd like to think is that if you go through a class with me is that it doesn't just end at the end of those 14 or 15 weeks. So, um, so yeah, so the hypothesis tool has really, uh, when I saw the uh, tool for the first time, it was so clear to me that this was something that would really match up with a lot of the things that I was always trying to accomplish. Um, and yeah, so I have a lot, I have a lot to say. <laughs> it's good stuff. That's great, Sylvia. I love that. I love the idea of hypothesis as a way to bring high touch interaction to uh, larger courses. Um, Christy, why don't uh, we go next? And I think Sylvia uh, reframed my question a little bit. Like, tell us a little bit about your teacher and then uh, yourself as a teacher. And then how does hypothesis fill, uh, fit into that philosophy? Sure. So um, my background is actually in K-12 education. I spent a few years teaching high school history uh, before I 
moved to uh, Rutgers University where I was an instructional designer. And um, I also have taught online at the university level for NJIT and for Rutgers Camden. So, um, so I, like Sylvia, I've seen hypothesis as an instructional designer working with faculty, and I've also seen it as an instructor myself. Um, and I personally was interested in um, using it when I was uh, designing online classes because I had this weird conflict of, uh, I'm an instructional designer and I um, really advocate for online classes to be, you know, planned from day one and we want everything laid out and, you know, everything should be ready to go um, in these asynchronous formats. But at the same time, I don't want to be the sage on the stage that's just giving my like top down information to my students. Um, as Sylvia was saying, my students come with a wealth of experiences. And I was trying to look for ways that um, I could have them bring their experiences to the online class. So whether they're talking about and sharing and connecting um, their experiences from other classes, what they've learned, um, what they have, you know, just experienced in their own life. So I'm teaching a gender and technology class right now. And so a lot of their own lived experiences are really um, relevant to, to the material. Uh, so I want them to be experts in my class as well. And Hypothesis has been a really great way to do that. That's awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, and just to clarify real quick, Christy's teaching online. Sylvia, are, do you have a synchronous meeting as well in your class or are you also fully online? Uh, well, my preferred modality is fully in, in the classroom because um, uh, I need a challenge the time for the past couple of years. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yes, I've, I've been teaching fully online since 2004 and uh, hybrid since 2008. So uh, right now I'm teaching uh, hybrid. OK. Yeah. All right, Rachel, tell us a little bit about your teaching philosophy and how hypothesis fits in. Uh, sorry, you're on mute right now. All right. So I'm a nurse and um, I began teaching nursing in 2005. Um, then, let's see, I came to Rutgers and I am the director of their pre-licensure program. Um, so I deal a lot with curriculum and, and we look at, you know, what are we teaching the students and, and what, what are some different ways that we can help them to learn that information. And one thing that I like about social annotation is that it really supports universal, uh, universal learning and design principles, universal design for learning principles. And it really helps to create that inclusive environment. Um, like what's been previously said that our students, you know, they, they come with their own life experiences and that impacts how they view the material that you're giving to them, how they learn it. So it's important that with, um, with the inclusivity of social annotation, it gives students multiple means of engagement, of interaction, of expression. Uh, and it, it lets us know as the faculty, you know, we actually learn more from the students sometimes than we're, we're teaching to them. Um, it also puts the students in the driver's seat. So the students, instead of becoming passive, you know, receptacles for the knowledge, they become the creators of the knowledge and the learning with social annotation. Another connection with nursing specifically is that, you know, in nursing, we talk a lot about critical thinking and clinical judgment. And, you know, our nurses really have to be able to think on their feet and make complex decisions. Uh, social annotation fits in nicely. So there, there is a popular uh, nursing theory. It's a nursing model for clinical judgment that supports thinking and it's by Christine Tanner. Uh, it's called the clinical judgment model and it focuses on uh, noticing, interpreting, then responding and reflecting. So when you look at social annotation, that's exactly what we're asking the students to do. We're asking them to hey, take a look at this article, notice what's important to you, um, then interpret that. So they're gonna think about, okay, what, well, I like this part of the article, but, but why do I like it? Why is it important to me? Is it important to something I've learned before, something uh, we're learning in this class, um, something that I've seen in clinical, or maybe even something um, in their personal lives uh, that, that, that they can bring to the table for everyone in class to share. 
but in a safe space. So social annotation creates a safe space. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, in nursing, we talk about sensitive topics and you'll ask a question in class and the room is silent. But when you put it into social annotation um, by giving them an article to look at, uh, they, they feel safer because it's an online environment. They feel safer to say what they're thinking. Um, so they also get to not only interpret, but they get to respond. You know, they're, they're telling you, okay, these are my thoughts. And then they can reflect. They reflect on their own thoughts uh, through, and they reflect on their classmates' thoughts by conversing, um, replying in the annotation aspect. So I really like social annotation and its use for nursing. Oh, that's awesome, Rachel. Thanks for that. Um, I want to follow up with you specifically about that model uh, for clinical judgment that, that you were re referring to, because I think that could be something cool to share elsewhere in our uh, you know, community of practitioners. Let's use that as a springboard to go back to Sylvia and Christy to tell us a little bit about how, how social annotation specifically connects to your disciplines. One of the really neat things about this group one of the really neat things about what's going on at Rutgers with Hypothesis is it's a really vast diversity of um, disciplines that are using Hypothesis. I have to give a shout out because I thought this was really cool. For the past couple semesters, it's been a Caribbean studies uh, course that's the most annot uh, heavily annotated course, not that, you know, volume matters necessarily, um, but uh, there's quite a diversity. Um, we heard about the connection to nursing and uh, Christy, you're coming from sort of a gender studies place and Sylvia from social informatics. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how that particulars of that discipline, what you're trying to get students to do and how social annotation helps with that. Maybe starting with Christy. Sure. So um, the students in, in my class are uh, often coming from a lot of different majors. Um, like some of them are gender studies majors, but gender studies uh, a lot of times is not a primary major at Rutgers Camden. Um, they have, a lot, we have a lot of minors or double majors. Um, so for me, the, the gender studies class really overlaps with so many other disciplines and the social annotation allows the students to bring their experience from these other disciplines into the class. So students have talked about what they've learned in their anthropology classes. Um, I think an annotation this week had a, a criminal justice major was talking about how um, what she's learned in criminal justice applies to the, the um, gender and technology things we were discussing with like algorithms um, and facial recognition. Um, so it's really, like I kind of said before, this is a little bit repetitive, but just an experience to let those overlaps with other subjects kind of creep in, um, in a more natural way. And also we do kind of start the class off with more like heavy theory of gender studies and it helps the students um, understand that better because they're seeing what each other is thinking. So they often will just ask a question of like, what do they mean by this? And other students will respond to them. Well, I think that the author is saying this, or I'm interpreting it as why. And most of the time they answer each other and I don't have to say anything in the end besides like, yeah, you got it. <laughs> uh, so it, it really helps them also, you know, get through the more dense material. That's awesome. Sylvia, how does it connect to informatics? Well, uh, a lot of students that uh, uh, come to the information technology and informatics program are kind of under a bit of misunderstanding about what the nature of the program is about. Um, so we are going to teach them things about information technology, uh, but the field is really centered around a social sciences approach to understanding all the different impacts that happen when you put human behavior, human practices in contact with um, rich uses of information technology. So um, a lot of the times um, uh, for especially the social informatics class, uh, uh, I'm having to explain uh, disciplinary differences, which are abstract. And frankly, if you're new to the field, they're weird. Um, there's also uh, the goal that I have for that class um, is to introduce them to the kinds of research 
uh, that social informatics uh, scholars do. And um, the whole sequence of assignments is designed to introduce them to, okay, if you want to develop better tech, if you want to implement tech in a more effective way, uh, there is research that has some answers for you and you need to go be able to look at that research and interpret it successfully. And because these this is a 200 level class, uh, it's mostly sophomores, sometimes I get a junior or two, um, most of them haven't read research studies and there's a lot of questions. So sometimes what I'm asking them, basically what I'm asking them to do is to go through the article and use the annotations. And the annotations can be anything from a bringing in personal experiences to, uh, I don't understand what the heck they mean by prosopography. What, you know, what is that term? Um, so, uh, and I tell them that I'm going through and I'm looking at what they're, they're annotating and I'm using those opportunities to answer them. Uh, sometimes, uh, like what Christy was saying, they answer each other and all I have to do is kind of go, yeah, you know, um, but uh, sometimes, uh, they really do need my guidance because they're reading in a genre, they're reading a type of writing that it's not just decoding the language, it's also decoding a whole superset of structures, um, which I think would be pretty much impossible. Uh, I, I, have not, I have not had a ton of success with the research study analysis assignment until I figured out how to interleave it with um, the uh, annotation exercises. Um, so it gives them enough confidence in I'm successfully identifying the pieces and what's going on in this research to then be able to write about it and present about it for themselves. So, um, so yeah, I see this, uh, uh, I've, I've done a lot of different things in this class. I've been teaching it since 2004. Uh, but the rewrite, the last couple of rewrites over the lockdown, uh, because we were forced online and I had to make better use of it, uh, really pushed it to, oh, you know, something clicked into place. And it's not that everything is perfect, but suddenly we are able to do things or get the students to learn how to do things in, a, in this 15 weeks that we couldn't get them to do before successfully. So that was a big deal. For me, at least, I was really excited. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so as I was saying earlier, uh, a lot of you guys are old school in terms of your use of hypothesis at Rutgers. I was looking at some data this morning um, and I was seeing some of the first usage was, was in 2019. Um, not sure if that was some of you guys. I know that the School of Communication and Information was um, one of the first to start to play around with the tool. Shout out to Veronica Armour. I don't know if she's still there. Um, and that Christy was the early there at Camden and, um, you know, uh, herself and others there using the tool. And Rachel, I, I know you've been using it for many semesters. Um, and I'll just say that just really quickly to sort of impress upon the idea that um, of what grew out of those early experiments, you know, over 10,000 students at Rutgers since 2019 have used hypothesis, which is a pretty pretty healthy number. Um, so my question is, how has your use of social annotation um, evolved over that time of when you first discovered the tool and you might have assigned uh, social annotation assignments a certain way and, and where you are now? Has there been any growth or sophistication in how you're assigning the tool? Um, and I will just grant the fact that there was a pretty major uh, global disruption in the in the middle of that that <laughs> probably affected any kind of linear uh, progression of like uh, how one would use the tool and, and challenge the use of the tool. So you could also mention, you know, how a push to remote if you were synchronous like like Sylvia before uh, forced you into new ways of using the tool. But just talk a little bit about how your relationship with hypothesis and how using the classroom has evolved. And let's go back to Rachel. Uh, interestingly enough, I started using or I first was introduced to Hypothesis, uh, right when the pandemic started, Rutgers Camden offered a certificate in online learning and Christy was one of the teachers and she introduced me to social annotation. And I actually got to participate in it as a student. So I saw it from the other side and then all these ideas started popping into my head like, oh wow, this has so many uses for, for me, for nursing, I can use that. And 
for my students. So that's how I was introduced to it. And initially, you know, I would assign an article, give the students expectations like this many annotations, this many responses. And then over time, it's, it has evolved. I have a rubric now. Um, I don't just use it as an outside of class activity. I, I pull it into class. So we, we use it as an in-class activity. Um, one of the big things I look for, like I used to assign articles on, you know, most of the topics that we were covering weekly, but I try to get to those more sensitive issues now because that's when I notice the students really open up because we can't get that back and forth in class conversation-wise on sensitive topics. So like when we talk about things um, like addiction and equity and diversity, inclusion, LGBTQ issues in, in healthcare, students kind of, they'll, they'll shut down, they'll listen to what you're teaching them, right? But they're not really diving deep into the knowledge. They're not engaging, engaging with it, which they're able to do with social annotation. Uh, also in another class, um, evidence, I teach a research and evidence-based practice course, you know, uh, what Sylvia was saying, how she used it so the students could be introduced to like really reading research. Uh, that's, I had students do that as well. So I would divide the article into components and divide them into groups and make it a group activity and tell them, you know, this is what you're looking for and this is how to dissect an article. And this is, you know, for this type of evidence. Now let's do it with another type of evidence. And it introduces them to different sources and getting more comfortable in the reading. Um, so, you know, we could look at a research study, we could look at a clinical practice guideline or a position statement. Um, it, it supports advocacy and the students start thinking about, oh, well, yeah, I'm reading this and, and now I want to do this and, and be an advocate for my patients. It's um. awesome. Christy, how's your practice evolved? Sounds like you were the, the beginning of the use of the tool for, for Rachel herself, which is awesome. Yeah. So um, I first used it in fall 2019. Uh, I taught the gender and technology class online asynchronously that fall. Um, and then honestly, this is my, the next time I've taught the classes currently because COVID hit, I was doing instructional design support and um, there was not a lot of extra time to be teaching. So, so uh, this is the second time I've been using Hypothesis in the asynchronous online class. Um, I actually haven't really made changes with how I used it from that first run because it worked really well. My class, um, my online class tends to be pretty small. It's about 25 students. And um, the way I set it up was I just wanted the students to feel free to get in there and have a conversation without having um, pressure of specific expectations. So I was trying to avoid creating um, kind of the, the sometimes you know in online classes the discussion board can be a little bit more like stilted um, with the post and reply and I wanted this to be more informal so I basically give the students the instruction of you need to go in and annotate here are some examples of what a you know a substantial annotation is um, you can ask a question you can reply to a classmate about answering a question you can talk about your own experience and how it connects to that you know they have a couple bullets of like what a good annotation is like not just like I agree um and I have no requirements of how many annotations they have to post just the assignment each week is annotate the readings and it's pass fail you you annotate you um you get credit and if you don't annotate you don't get credit so uh that system worked well for me I have some students that go in and really mark the document up um, and some other students go in and just say a, a few words here or there. So, um, but in the end, I feel that the goal of them, you know, really digging into the reading and bringing their experiences to the reading um, has been met. And that's why I didn't really make any changes to what I was doing. So we'll see how it goes this semester. Thanks, Christy. Sylvia, how's your practice with social annotation evolved? Oh my. Uh, well, I, I've been using it every semester since I think, I want to say it was before 2019, honestly, because I think I was using it, I know I was using it prior to the Canvas integration, because the Canvas integration did make things a lot easier. Um, 
it yeah, I was looking just at Canvas stats for 2019, so it's very possible. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So the uh, uh, the first couple of rounds were not successful <laughs> because we had a lot of technical issues. Um, the uh, the Camden integration made part of it easier. Uh, what I found I had to do was sort of fiddle with it a little bit because. Um, uh, initially, I was uh, giving it some grade weight, uh, but not enough. So I had too high a percentage of the students were kind of blowing it off um, because it felt like too much for not enough. Um, and that drove me crazy because I was like, you'll get so much more out of this if you just do this. So the lockdown actually gave me a language to talk about that um, because I was like, whenever we are synchronous, it's costing everybody a lot in terms of resources to be able to all be together at the same time. And I don't want to waste time dragging things out of you. Um, so part of what, and I actually wrote this up as a page in the getting started section of the online and the hybrid courses, which explained like, this is what I think we're doing with hypothesis. Feel free to disagree with me, but you know this is why, this is why I do things the way I do them. Um, and the uh, uh, I want to make those if we're in the classroom or if we are on the Zoom meeting. I only have you for an hour and twenty minutes, and I need to get as much value out of that hour and twenty minutes as possible. Um, you know, so it's not like I don't want to be your taskmaster, where you know I'm just smacking you to keep you moving. Um, but what you will find is if you've done at least a little bit of the reading and you pre-verbalized some of the things you're thinking about the reading, then you're going to be much more willing to come in and talk. Uh, and after the first, I think the first two semesters teaching during the pandemic, it suddenly struck me that something that was missing because we had so many just logistic issues with, you know, getting everybody together uh that we weren't always doing a good job of following up so i turned the assignment which i had been doing kind of in two phases which is you get some of the points for doing the initial set of annotations and then you get some of the points for the participating in the group activities based on those annotations in the classroom the last year i've been doing it as a three phase so you get each activity is worth 30 points out of a thousand uh, you get 10 points for doing the initial set of annotations, you get 10 points for doing a good job in the classroom meeting, and then each week I'm giving them a follow up thing to do. And I've been using, I've, I've found the follow ups to be very flexible. So like the first phase annotations is always the same, just go in, look at what we're reading this week and going to be discussing, give me five things, you know, I kind of give them a little bit of a ballpark because they're undergraduates, you know, they want a word count. Um, and then, uh, but for the follow-up phase, I can do things like, uh, like for example, um, I expanded the use from social informatics into information visualization. So we've been giving them Tufty, uh, which is dense and chewy and lots of examples. Um, so the Tufty is kind of like the bedrock, but there's lots of other things that we're giving them to look at. So in the follow-up phases, I've been saying things like, okay, go look at the examples in the other reading that I didn't have you do annotations on and pull those into, you know, as examples of what Tufty is talking about in, in this thing. Or uh, sometimes I'll ask them to do something in their discussion group in the classroom and then report out in an additional annotation back to the original reading. Uh, there's, I've, I've really been very happy. There's a lot of different changes I can ring with that depending on what I need them to be doing that particular week to kind of solidify the work that we did together in the classroom. So um, yeah, but it took me, it took me a few goes to figure out what was the right number, like how much weight is too much weight. And uh, now the issue we're working on is, well, it obviously, I need them to be doing some of the cognitive work in the class, and that happens in the classroom. Um, but we still have students that are stretched mighty thin with extra jobs, people getting sick, uh, stuff like that. Thank God that's starting to die back a little. Um, so I'm working on trying to figure out what's a good attendance policy uh, because, you know, I need you there. 
for some of this. I maybe don't need you there as much for some of this, but striking the right balance. But yeah, once they kind of get the sense that, oh, Sylvia really is reading these. Oh, Sylvia is really responding every time I have a question then that opens up all kinds of possibilities. So there have been some really delightful conversations uh, that have erupted uh, in these annotations, um, especially with the InfoViz students this year, um, because there are all kinds of directions you can move off in. So yeah, I, I hope that's not too long an answer, but it really has been a journey <laughs> over the last few years with this. No, that was a great answer. There's so many different points in there that I wanted to highlight, but I really love the idea. You're going to say it better than I'm going to recap, but about, you know, making the synchronous time is precious, make it count. And this is a tool that kind of can help, help that help, help make your synchronous time really count. Well, I'll tell you that of all the reasons I've given students for why I like using this tool in my classes, that's the one that really seems to click with at least yep. this group of undergraduates, because I know how much some of them are struggling to be there in the classroom, paying attention. You know, the, the whole time that we spend in intellectual development is a precious resource. And, you know, anything that helps us get and preserve that focus for that time, um, I think they really do appreciate because so much of their college experience has been disrupted by forces that none of us can control. Um, so prioritizing that focus, I think really seems, that seemed to be the, the tipping point for some and of it's, them. It's a real lesson, right? I've been on both sides of it, right? If you show up to teach a class and it's clear that people haven't done the reading, you know, it's less productive, right? And I've been on the other side of that where I didn't do the reading and I wasn't contributing to the productivity of that group time. And it happens in the workplace too, right? You show up to a meeting without an agenda, it's probably not going to be as, as focused. And so this, that's a real life skill, I think, to sort of, you know, put some investment into something before you, um, and then develop that investment, you know, collaboratively. So I, I love that idea. Um, so Christy this week uh, uh, tweeted a lovely uh, anecdote from a student. And so my next question is around um, the student response to the tool. Um, and I'll just want to read Christie's quote. Uh, a student literally just told me this week about hypothesis, quote, I really enjoy annotation, the annotation portion and reading my peers' comments. The annotations help me to understand the reading and get a chance to see other comments about what everyone was thinking. So we'll start with you, Christy, and then, uh, and then Rachel and then Sylvia. Just tell us a little bit about how your students have responded to uh, social annotation as a, as a classroom tool. So I just want to actually note about that quote too, that that was completely un, like, I did not prompt the student for that. Um, I really, I just emailed all my students this week to check in and be like, how are things going? How can I better support you? Very open-ended. So the student really just brought up annotation on her own. Um, but hypothesis, the other time I ran this course, um, was by far the most popular tool I was using, and it wasn't the only tool I was using, and the most popular assignment. Um, I actually asked specific questions about it in both the midterm evaluation and the end of course evaluations, and students um, very largely, I don't remember exactly the numbers, but um, really felt that the annotation helped them learn the most out of all of the assignments that we were doing in the class. Um, and I'm running the midterm um, evaluations again next week. So we'll see what they have to say this semester. But obviously, at least it's helping one student so far. But yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I feel like they really take to it um, and they get something out of it. And, you know, based on the feedback I have gotten, um, that is true from the student perspective as well. And Rachel, of course, you're a you're a student turned teacher user of the tool, <laughs> so you you know something about the student perspective. <laughs> yes, uh, interestingly, that Christy had said a student you know was giving social annotation hypothesis accolades. I had a student last semester, so at the end of the fall semester, when they filled out their um, course evaluation, they they said that um, I created a safe space for them. And it, it, you know, really, it touched my heart, first of all, but, you know, it, I was like, oh, wow, that's my goal. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you're seeing that um, and you're, and you're feeling that. 
that you know it's it's hard to talk about some things and we all know how much more comfortable people are to talk when when they're typing um, so the social adaptation when we're talking about those more more difficult topics the, the really that the, the safeness the safety that they feel and and really saying how they feel is important um to christy said something that made me think of something i wanted to say but it's it's left my mind so i'll let you know if that comes that thought comes back yeah. um but i i do also notice with social annotation um i've had students say to me you know i really like that article that you assigned this week and they actually they have fun with it um so it, it it's not like a chore oh this is i gotta get this off the checklist i gotta go do my social annotation assignment uh, they they actually have fun with it and enjoy it i feel like so much of what you guys are saying is oh just it's, it's warming my heart uh and uh i feel like i could have yeah it's, it's great uh sylvia how have your students responded to social annotation uh pretty well um one of the things that uh i know this is going to sound strange uh so i also do work in educational research uh for the computer science uh department from time to time um and one of the and i also one of my previous lives at Rutgers was working with the implementation and the building of uh, tools for very large enrollment stem discipline classes um and uh one of my big i think thing that they got a little sick of me talking about was not every F is the same. Um, so I, you know, I, I look at DFW rates, I think a little differently, which is kind of like Tolstoy. It's like every happy family is happy, but every unhappy family is unhappy in their own way. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I really have been paying attention to is, you know, who's falling off the back end of the bus um, with what I'm doing in my classes. And one of the things that I think, uh, is, and, I, and again, you know, I wish I could quantify this more precisely. Um, it really, to me, is a bit of a tone thing. But once I, I, once I kind of convince them that, no, I really am interested in what you have to say, and I want you to feel like you can ask questions, even if you think they're dumb and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, speaking of dumb questions, we actually, in one of the Tufty readings earlier this semester, um, Tufty shows a, an example of a stereo opticon view. And uh, so in the annotations, the students were like, I don't see what he's talking about. I don't see what he's talking about. So when we got to class, I mean, this whole conversation erupted, like those uh, magic images that you stare at and like another whole picture pops up. Nobody was getting it. I was like, guys, Number one, very few people can see this without the special viewer. And number two, you're viewing it on a PDF instead of the original book. It's not going to work. Um, but we we had a fun time with that. Anyway, um, but once you kind of convinced people that you know this is a safe space, they felt like this is something I can participate in. And if I can keep you with me for more of the course, if I can keep you with me through some stuff, which is maybe going to make sense a little later, but you know, for right now, I just need you to get through some of the basics with me. Um, that seems to be keeping more people in the class for longer. Um, so I don't think that the number of A's and B's has skyrocketed, but frankly, those are the students that were already doing pretty well using everything. And they like hypothesis. I would totally, you know, say that I've had a few comments it seems to indicate that this is something that they prefer to just reading alone. Um, but the uh, uh, but the thing that I have been noticing is that students that I'm pretty sure, given the circumstances, especially in the last few semesters, would have been Fs, um, have managed to kind of stick with the course a little longer because there is a way for them to participate, for them to build learning, even if they're not completely aware that they're doing it. Um, so that to me, um, that to me was a, for this past year, especially, it was a big win. Um, because one of the big concerns I had going into this was college is expensive. And, you know, I know that some of you are coming, I didn't say this to them directly, but I mean, talking with colleagues, it's like, I know that some of my students are coming with damn near insuperable obstacles to being able to focus on their learning. And, you know, my worry was that we were gonna see like this 
bottoming out and that bottoming out like the bottom half of the class just doesn't make it across the finish line um and you know that obviously is going to be largely ar around socioeconomic you know fault lines that you know we have in a public university um so this to me uh is i don't want to oversell it i mean like i'm sure that there were other there may have been other ways to have accomplished this, but at this moment, this tool, I think, was really a lifeline for at least, my classes are generally about 25 to 35 students. So typically in a class that size, I'm looking at five to seven that are weaker in terms of their preparation. And, you know, really it's keeping you know, four or five of those students out of maybe seven um, on the boat, uh, on, on the bus, on the boat, on the transportation system moving forward. So I don't know, um, I would love to see some, I know you guys probably do quantitative um, analysis, um, but it would be interesting to hook that up with, you know, what the um, ultimate course outcomes are, uh, because I, I haven't done this myself because I've been changing the way I use hypothesis over and over, but now with that, I feel like we're we're really settling into a more solid, you know, consistent pattern. That's something that I'd like to to really check out because, you know, at least anecdotally, that seems to me what I'm seeing in the classes is that's keeping more of the students with me longer. That's amazing. Um, I would love to. I love that anecdote, but I, I would love to substantiate it with a study in some way. Um, so I, I, we are looking for folks that are interested. I don't know if you teach multiple sections, Sylvia, and it always seems complicated, right? If you really feel like this is helping struggling students, like why deprive one, you know, section of it? <laughs> um, but that would be a way that we might be able to prove some of what you're saying. And but we certainly heard that elsewhere. Um, so we're going to turn and then try to uh, foreground some things from the chat. I will say there's been a request, uh, several requests for um, your assignments <laughs> that you teach with um, to be shared. And uh, Christy's already dropped that in the chat. And maybe um, Sylvia and Rachel, if you guys have assignments that you'd be willing to share, we can follow up with folks if you don't have a direct link right now. Um, but there's also one question that I wanted to surface around um, and we covered this a little bit. It sounded like Christy, uh, you and you shared your assignment, but you, you're a little more, more laissez-faire in uh, in terms of what you're asking. So you give them examples, and then Sylvia, it sounded like pretty sophisticated in terms of like first pass is this, second pass is this, and Rachel, you talked about a specific assignment, you know, with a with that one um, clinical model. Uh, so the question is. What specific guidelines do you, uh, well, this one, there's one that's specifically around specific guidelines for the safe space um, that you mentioned, Rachel, and how you cultivate that. And I think it's contained within the question that um, that's not just a hypothesis. You've also obviously created a, a, a culture of that in your course more broadly for students to feel that comfortable. But um, how do you set up the assignments? Let's, let's, let's start with that. So... One of the things is I, I have to explain what is hypothesis because the students, many of them never used it before. So that's first and foremost, but also um, in, in nursing, students wanna know exactly, okay, what do you expect from me? What do I have to do? And I also teach larger classes. So I don't teach huge classes, but you know I would consider 60 students to be a larger class. So they need some kind of structure and some kind of parameter. So I do assign a rubric um, and in the rubric, I have like three areas that I look at and they can get a total of 10 points. So they start out at the top. They can, they start out with their full 10 points. And the rubric basically says, you know, this is why you might get a point deducted. And I look at substantive entries is one topic and grammar and spelling is another one. And then participation is the third. But when we talk about substantive, what it really means is that, you know, whatever the student is annotating, they're, they're adding meaning to the conversation. So I give them some examples, like reflect on the reading. Um, what do you think? Uh, pose a question. Is something in there really making you think maybe you don't understand it? Um, connect the reading to what we're learning in class or, you know, your life or what you learned in another class. Um, so they'll get a point taken off if it's not substantive. You know, like Christy said, they can't just say, I agree. And then for grammar and spelling, you know, I, I'd like to see it have 
you know, good grammar and spelling. But I also in that column, I put, you know, that you can use emojis, you can use texting language. Um, I want you to convey emotion. So conveying emotion is important and you won't get points taken off, you know, for, for doing those types of things. Uh, and then for participation, you know, I have to be a little more structured with nursing. So I'll tell them, I wanna see a minimum of two annotations and one response to a classmate, but to encourage participation and that discourse that we get with social annotation, I say, but you'll get one extra point if you actually have more than your required um, annotations. That's good. And I actually want to fold a question into this one since you, you contained it there, Rachel, which is how do you set it up and to grade or not to grade? Are you grading them or how are you grading them? And, and Christy, you've already sort of answered some of this, but I did want to, uh, I mean, you can repeat a little bit of how you set up the students for, for using hypothesis and, and you mentioned that you're sort of a pass fail grader uh, for this assignment. But I, I remind, tell me if, if you do what, what, what Rachel does, which is um, encourage replies uh, to try to encourage that discursive aspect or uh, yeah, tell us a little more about how you set up your assignment. Um, so like I said, it's just my five minutes pass bill um, and they get credit for any type of annotation. So I actually, I, I, I linked to my um, specific instructions in the chat. Um, I tell them that they can reply to a classmate. Um, that's really all of the kind of encouragement I give them. And I do get in the beginning of the semester, my students are like, but how many do you mean? I'm like, really? Uh, I mean, as many as you would like to do. <laughs> so in the first week, they're a little like hesitant about that. Um, but I found that I really haven't had to kind of push them to reply to classmates. I have some students that some weeks go in and they only post replies to people. Um, and then other times people will have a mix. Some students don't really reply as much and just annotate their own thoughts really heavily. Uh, so I really get, I found that I really get a mix even without providing them a lot of guidance. I, um, there's always a pretty rich conversation going on often with like multiple back and forths or even mo more than one student like, you know, replying to one annotation. Um, so yeah, I haven't, I I don't like have an issue with using a rubric or anything. I just didn't want the students to get very hung up on getting a specific grade. I wanted their um, score around this to just be encouragement to, to go into the readings and do the assignment um, as a, a kind of informal conversation. So that was my reasoning there. And it's it's worked pretty well for you know my specific course. So anything more about your, um, how, you, how you tee things up and whether you grade or not? Oh, I'm sorry, was that for me? Yeah, just- uh, I've, got, I've got a cat okay. crying on the landing, so oh, no <laughs> I wanted to close the door. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I teach undergraduates um, and they're, they're wonderful. Um, you know, uh, I wouldn't run the assignment the same way for a graduate class. I have used this kind of tool in graduate courses and, you know, I don't do it the same way, but I get tired of having the how many annotations conversation. So, um, so what I did uh, at, what I do, what I started doing is at the start of the semester, I said, there are going to be X number of hypothesis activities this semester. The first phase is always the same, five annotations. I give them like, these are all acceptable kinds of annotations. You can reply, you can ask questions, you can comment, you can bring in additional things. I, I generally don't uh, pay much attention to grammar and spelling uh, in that instruction because I know that when I'm actually grading them, um, I'm not going to have the time. <laughs> um, so, you know, for that, for my purposes, it's like, okay, you know, I, I'm going to care about your grammar in other places, but not here. Um, and the, uh, uh, I go through, um, and this is the part that kind of happened by accident, um, but I don't know if you can see these. Um, so I kind of developed for myself a little spreadsheet that I print out X number of copies from. And in the prep time before I walk into the classroom or start the Zoom meeting, I would sit down and I would go through all the annotations for the reading that we were going to be discussing and I fire back comments and I answer questions and da da da. da. 
Um, so the students know that I am looking at this, you know, within the, you know within six hours before I'm walking into the classroom. So um, and of all the uh, grading and as my anybody who's had a class with me can tell you, I am sometimes very late with turning in grades. I am never late with that part of the um, uh, of the feedback because. The way I see it is the whole point of this is the high touch is that they feel like they're getting heard and they're being seen. So if I don't deliver on that, I've just cut the legs out right. from under my my efforts. Um, so the uh, so yeah so I, I I do actually this one is pretty good, um, but I do little notes for myself like this person only posted four out of five annotations. The first phase is always the same five annotations. Um, the second phase is always, what are you doing with me in the classroom? And then the third phase is always the follow-up, which changes mm -hmm. from week to week. Um, so uh, I was trying to reduce the complexity because what I was finding for some students was, I don't want to have a conversation about how many annotations and talking about this many annotations for this reading and this many annotations. That, that was just bogging everybody down. Um, I don't think, I do think that would be a useful strategy in other settings. Um, so let me be real clear about that. But in this, in my particular case, it was just needless complexity. Yeah. So, uh, so the first phase is always the same. The third phase uh, gets released to them. And sometimes um, my favorite thing to do, although I can't do it every week, is I will post direct questions back to them based on what I am seeing in their annotations. And then their follow-up phase is to write a you know, 150, 200 word reply to the question that I have left for them. Um, and is that question, Sylvia, happening in an annotation? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, this is, yeah, you, you are very high touch and it's very impressive. And your anecdote about coming from Santa Lawrence to Rutgers is, uh, is wonderful. Um, so you are annotating. I did want to ask that question to others. Like, and again, one of the neat things about hypothesis is it's used in a lot of different ways, a lot of different courses, and oh, yeah. in many ways there's no no right and wrong. But I'm just curious, Rachel and Christy, do you annotate as well, or do you let that be the student space and and stand back and, and watch or follow up in other ways? Um, to annotate or not to annotate alongside the students is the question. Go, go oh, for Christy. Oh, Rachel, sorry. Again. So it depends on how. Um, Busy I am at the time. So sometimes I'll jump in and I'll annotate. Uh, other times I don't. So yes and no. Uh, but I do enjoy the annotation part of it. Uh, with such large classes, sometimes it's hard to do that. Um, so I divide the students usually into groups for an annotation assignment. Um, An LMS system makes it easy to do that. Yeah. And once they're divided in the groups, then I can kind of go in and, and I have their, their small group that it's easier for me to have a to make a comment and I'm not making a comment on you know 60 individuals as opposed to oh I see what you're talking about within your group and maybe you know ask them another question or add to their conversation yeah that's great Christy um so I usually don't go and participate in the annotations um mostly because uh, they don't get the notifications from Hypothesis, and I want to make sure that they see what I'm saying. So I, I will either reply to them in like the private Canvas comments, mm. or I will make like a broader um, comment to the class in an announcement or something like that. So I tend to stay hands off in annotations, but make sure I, like they know I'm reading them in, in some way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, just to clarify, um, the, the annotations that I post back to them are not the grade. <laughs> um, right. The, uh, the I, I have actually some boilerplate that I work with. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing that goes back in the comments is, this is to acknowledge that you did the five annotations or you weren't completely successful with the five annotations. The second paragraph is, this is what you need to do for the follow-up. And the third paragraph is if the follow-up is done and it gives the due dates. Um, so I try to keep the uh, the conversation, I try to keep the conversation and the annotations kind of like what I do with them in the classroom. And I'll say this, um, you know, because as I'm getting older and the anecdotes are piling up in my brain, um, responding back to them in the annotations means that I have you know, imparted that funny little story, but I didn't take up class time to do it. <laughs> um, yep. So 
I, you know, I kind of dropped it where I thought it would do the most good and then I can kind of let it go. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, but it's a, it's a balancing act. It definitely is a balancing act. I could go on all afternoon with this conversation. It's been amazing. Uh, so many different pieces to jump off from. I know people have other places to go and we've already pushed past our time and I see Franny and Nate coming to tell us to wrap it up. So I just want to thank you all for a great conversation and for your long-term collaboration around social annotation uh, and teaching and learning, which has you know, really been a privilege to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah thank so you much. so much. Really enjoyed it.